I've made a few watch collecting mistakes and watch collecting mistakes suck because they're expensive mistakes. So learn through my stupidity. For those of you who don't know me, hi, my name is Brittany, AKA Watch Gringa, and I'm on the team here at Bob's Watches. Miraculously, <laughs> I am far beneath the employment of Bob's Watches. But I'm gonna keep milking this thing really as long as they'll keep me on. And I feel like I should say as well, this isn't my house. That's not my views. We're house and dog sitting for some friends. So we got to stay in their dope house. It's awesome. Today we are talking about watch collecting mistakes. Some of them are mistakes I've made. Some of them are mistakes I've seen other collectors make or heard stories about. It's so easy to make mistakes in the watch collecting game, but we learn from them, we grow from them. Sometimes they are unfortunately expensive lessons to learn. Hopefully these will be helpful for you if you're new to watch collecting or just like helpful little reminders if you're like an OG veteran of the game. I guess more, more of a seasoned collector would be a more posh way to put it. So let's get into the Gringa top five watch collecting mistakes. This one, you guys, this one, this is too real for me. And honestly, guys, I'm so guilty of this one. So it's relying too much on the things you read on the internet, the dimensions, the specs, making judgments off the things that you read on the internet alone. There are so many times I'll read a case size online and I'll make a snap judgment on whether I'll like that watch or if that watch will fit me or not. But it's really not a reliable way to make decisions. Take the Rolex Daytona and the Rolex Submariner for an easy example of watches that most people know. The previous versions of the Submariner were a 40 millimeter case and the Daytona is also a 40 millimeter case. But the watches sit and wear very differently. The Submariner is chunkier and thicker and sportier, whereas the Daytona is just that little bit more refined, closer to the wrist, small lugs that make it feel more like a 39 millimeter than a 40 millimeter case. Both dimensions on the spec sheet are the same, but a wildly different wearing experience. I lived through this one firsthand myself with my NAMOS. So I used to have a NAMOS Tangente Sport at 36 and a half millimeters, which normally for me is the sweet spot. Everything on the spec sheet made it seem like it was the perfect watch for me. But those lugs, those NAMOS lugs, they're wild. They're so big. <laughs> I would say the Namas Tangente Sport wears probably more like a 39 millimeter than a 36 and a half. And I just didn't like it for me personally in my wrist size. Get the watch on your wrist, try it on. And you know, allow yourself to be surprised about what watches you might actually like on the wrist. Ooh, this is a part of myself that I started noticing a few months back and I was like, okay, we need to air this out. Yes, Benson. Would you like to say hello? Hello. I mean, I personally didn't buy too many watches too quickly because that exchange involves this little thing called money, which apparently I don't have a lot spare at the moment. But I always feel like this weird pressure to acquire more. I'll see my watch Instagram friends getting like new watch after new watch, or there'll be a new watch drop or something. And I can feel my little primitive monkey brain like, I want it, I need it. It's so pretty and shiny and rah, I need it. You know, but watch collecting is a marathon, not a sprint. Take your time, try watches on. Think about which ones are speaking to you, where you see your collection going. But this life is long. There will be many, many more watch drops. Fads will come and go, but it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. But you know, when you do love something and it's speaking to you and you know it's perfect, pull that trigger, enjoy it. You deserve it, babes. Go on. Now this is what I warned my husband about all the time and I truly stand by it. Do not buy a watch you don't really want. Do not buy a watch you think you're settling for. 
The struggle is real. I see it all the time with my husband, James. I'll never forget it. He was waiting to get his GMT Master 2, so the BLRO, the Pepsi bezel uh, GMT Rolex. He had been waiting for years, and I remember he was sulking around the house like, Brittany, I've just accepted I'm never gonna get it. <laughs> I'm gonna buy the Tudor GMT. Now the Tudor GMT is a dope watch. I'm a firm lover of Tudor. I'm actually wearing my Tudor Black Bay 58 right now. But I was like, James, no, no, like don't do it. It's not the watch he really wanted and it wouldn't have scratched the itch of the watch that he really wanted. If he loved the Tudor, he always wanted the Tudor, I'd be like, pony up, baby. Like, we're gonna go buy it right now. But I just knew if he bought the Tudor, just because he was sad and felt like, oh, I have the money now. I just wanna buy the watch now. And because of that, got the watch he didn't really want, it would never fully scratch that itch. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be the thing he ultimately wanted. It's a really expensive Band-Aid but it's not what he wants. It's not gonna scratch the itch. You know, I'm worried this is making me sound really snobbish against Tudor and I promise I'm not. I love Tudor. In fact, I have a whole video on my channel, Watch Gringa, talking about how I don't think Tudor is the poor man's Rolex. I truly love Tudor, but I think with modern Tudor, it's its own thing now. It's kind of, I don't know, it's got its own brand identity. It's got its own thing. And if you want a Rolex, a Tudor doesn't scratch that itch. If there's something I've learned along this journey, it's that you can't look back and be like, man, if I didn't sell that then, it would be worth this much now. Or, man, if I would have just picked up a 5711 in 1998, it'd be worth this much now. James, my husband James actually has one of those stories. James, tell them about the time you sold your Pepsi. Do you want to come tell the people of the world about uh, the time you sold a little Pepsi in the 90s? Yeah, sure. So Hold on, let me give you the mic. It was the reference 16700, so it was a GMT rather than the GMT2, so you, you couldn't independent excuse me independently set the gmt hand so it was kind of the sapphire crystal version of the original i had it for maybe two or three years uh, and then i started a new position which was quite a drop in wage um, because it was something that i was then going to progress further and further in my field in then had a daughter who sapped all the spare cash I had. Ew, babies. Yeah. And so uh, I made the decision to sell it. And back then they just, they were like most secondhand goods that they sold for less than you'd paid for them. And I'm, I was quite happy with that. Um, looking back, if I'd kept hold of it, it would have been worth a lot more money. But at the time it was what I needed to do for the family. So there you go. Don't look back, like coulda, shoulda, woulda. It's just a recipe for misery. You cannot remorse on selling a watch. It sucks, it's a sore spot, but you probably sold it for a reason at that time. James and his family needed that money at that time and that's what they needed to do. You can't look back and change the past or you can't like think back to like the time in 1998 when you passed up a Nautilus. You probably passed it up because uh, you didn't like it. <laughs> You can't regret that. Do not remorse past decisions. Live in the now, enjoy your collection now, and dream about the ones you want to add to your life. This is the biggest problem plaguing our community right now. People who are so stuck in their ways of collecting and everyone else is just stupid. Whether you're a Rolex fanboy who's like, Rolex is king, or a budget collector, or one of the indie guys who like to collect watches that look frankly strange. Don't become such a snob. Don't become so stuck in your ways that you think the way you collect is the only valid way of collecting. Don't make other people feel bad about their collections and the watches that they love. Don't be that guy. Don't be that guy or gal. It's not the look, it's not the mood. It's actually so ugly. You might fall in love with a watch that I don't particularly like for whatever reasons. And that's all right, you do you, boo-boo. What does it matter to me anyways? It's none of my business. Like. <laughs>
<laughs> this is a weird and wonderful little hobby and it takes all kinds of kinds. Don't be a horrible snob. And yeah, this applies to you as well, budget collectors. I've seen it in some of y'all. Y'all can have this like reverse snobbery. Oh, uh, I would never get a Rolex. How much did you pay for that watch? For that movement? That's so stupid. I would never do that. I would never pay for that. Like, damn, just let people live their lives. No one is making you buy that watch. Nobody cares. Remember, worth and value are very different things to very different people. Just let people live their lives. <laughs> that turned into a bit of a rant, I feel like. I need to get that off my chest, though. I'm glad. I'm glad we had this talk. All right, watch fam, as always, we want to hear from you. What are some of the biggest watch mistakes you've made? Any advice you give new collectors? I don't know, tell us everything in those comments down below. And if you're not subscribed to Bob's Watches, like, come on now, what are you doing with your life? Subscribe now. Like this video, leave us a comment, do all those things to feed the algorithm gods. And until next time, bye guys.